Dr. Cohn, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we're going to have a little time now for some conversation, questions back and forth, and we're blessed to have Denise Anderson here, who is the moderator, co-moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA, the National Church. She lives in this area, so we're blessed not only for that, as she's a member of National Capital Presbytery, and she's our moderator, and she's going to ask a question and respond. She, you, you've, she's got a mic. And then we'll have other questions as well. First, I want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Cohn, uh, for what you've just done, as if you don't do it enough for us as it is. And um, as my brother Roy shared, I, along with Reverend Dr. Jan Edmiston, uh, share the office of moderator of the General Assembly. And at our past General Assembly, we just elected our very first ever African-American stated clerk, the Reverend Dr. J. Herbert Nelson. Now, that means that the chief ecclesiastical officer and the two women who hold the highest elected position in this denomination, no white men to be seen in that leadership, which of course does not represent the reality of our denomination. See, I, w I was baptized AME and was in the AME church for a long time. This is a, this is a shift for me. Uh, <laughs> But just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> and for a denomination that is 90% white, we know what the power undercurrent or overcurrent in our in our in our denomination is. And I, I was I, I led a panel discussion uh, a little bit earlier this week and I talked about how difficult it can be to be brown in the Peace USA because to be brown in such a profoundly white space is to be constantly hurt through microaggressions, through uh, macroaggressions, through aggressions, period. Uh, and, and a lot of times that is unintentional and someone asks, well, do you call it out? Do you, do you teach people so that they know to do better later? I said, okay, yes, but people have done that for many, many years. Sometimes I feel like it and sometimes I don't. Uh, and nevertheless, nevertheless, also, we're not always in a safe position to tell our truth. You talked in the cross and the lynching tree about Martin Luther King's proximity to the suffering of black people that allowed him to identify with the cross in a way that Reinhold Niebuhr simply could not. And so we know that it is theology that comes from this experience that will be our greatest teacher in dismantling white supremacy and racism. But I want to know is how long do we have to teach? What is white folks work? So the question is how long do we have to teach? And my answer is to Judgment Day. Uh, you have to work yourself into a space and into a style of ministry where teaching and preaching and living and acting becomes a way of life and doesn't depend upon the response of those you're trying to teach. The thing you do is to bear witness to the gospel. And that witness always makes people uncomfortable. It always disturbs the peace. So, you wake up every day knowing that you have the gift of ministry and you just do what you call to do. And you let God take care of them. That's what I would do. That's what I've been doing. Because we, you know, 
Jesus lived in a society in which he was a minority. That's why black people have an understanding of him. See, Jesus lived under the Roman Empire. We live under the American Empire. Same thing. <laughs> and the odds are against us. But who cares about odds? As long as we got truth on our side. Uh, we have, we have, we have a power that far outweighs anything the enemy can do. And that's what that gospel is. Yeah. That's why it's gospel is good news, not for people with power, but for people who don't have that. So we have to remember, we are, see, you're in a position that looks like power. <laughs> <clears throat> and you have to be reminded that you're probably somewhat like Esther. Amen. So you're in the thing. So you have to speak for others that's not where you are. Because you will have a voice of the king, the people in power. So that's a big responsibility. But I'm sure you are for it. <laughs> so I promised, I promised um, Dr. Cohn that it would not be pastors and ministers who dominate the conversation. So I'm going to ask those of you who are neither pastors nor ministers who have a comment or a question to do so now. Because the rest of us have a way of dominating conversations that is not always helpful. Am I right? Yes, sir. Dr. Cohn, my name is uh, Charles Watson, and uh, you struck me with your th thing of artistry and, and images. Yeah. And so my question to you is, um, if we can't be, that's the right way to say it, if we can't be white in America and be Christian, because that's power. Yeah. And we can't be male on earth and be Christian. Yeah. Because that's power. Yeah. Shouldn't our image of God be a woman of color? Yeah, I think, and there are men and women as theologians who are saying that. Take a look at Jacqueline Grant and her book on Jesus. Jesus becomes a black woman. I think it is true to say that God is always where the powerless are. If you with power, you're not with God. Now that's the truth. So that that that's true. God is identified, Jesus is identified, the Christian is identified with the crucified people on the bottom. That's the that's the power of blackness. Blackness tells you where the bottom is. Yeah. That's why it's a powerful symbol. That's why it frightens people. Just by walking down the street, they think you're going to kill them or something. <laughs> Which you probably ought to do. <laughs> no, 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 I'm a minister. I'm a minister. I, don't, I don't believe in that. No, okay. <laughs> Saint Saint Paul did say rhetorically, how many of you were strong? How many of you were powerful? How many of you were intellectual? But God chose to call the weak, the powerless, those with nothing in this world, to shame the wise, the powerful. The foolishness of God is revealed in the powerlessness 
of God. There may be... Yeah. No. Yeah, 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 it's good. It's good. You're my teacher. Yeah, okay. Thank so you. there may be other questions. I'm sure there are other questions. Yes, ma'am. Mine is not a question, it's a comment. First, yes. I want to say thank you for the book. Yeah, thank you. And this is the most painful book I've ever read. It's got me to the very core of my being. And when I read about the woman whose stomach was ripped open yes, with the twins. Yes, Mary as, Turner. As a mother, that really struck with me. Yeah. yeah. And so I gave my daughter the book to read. And she said, how can a black woman reading this book and how can black people knowing this go ahead and have children? They must have deep faith. They must believe better will come. And I'm not sure. I don't know what to tell her, even though I do believe better will come. What do you think? Well, I, I think we must not let the lynchers have the last word. We cannot do that. Uh, and hope is found in resistance. It's not only you working against it. There's a power, a mystery in this world that's also working. And it's found in the powerless. Uh, you know, we, we've been enslaved, we've been lynched, we've been Jim Crow. We've been shot down in the street, in prison, but we're still here. And our movement, civil rights, black freedom movement, has inspired people all over the world. Our music has inspired people all over the world. You can't go anywhere. When they were singing, when, they, when the Berlin Wall came down, they were singing, we shall overcome. When the, when the Filipinos were fighting against Marcos, marching, they were singing, we shall overcome. And in Tiananmen Square, they were singing, we shall overcome. We have inspired the world, a little minority, a nobody. We have a lot to be proud of. Don't let them, don't let them, you know, I write about it, but they ain't going to let them silence me. They ain't going to defeat me. And as long as you got your voice, as long as you can bear witness against it, there is hope. Don't forget that. That's why I go to church. <laughs> I ain't going to get much else there. Except a little hope. <laughs> That's all you're going to get. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. Um, thank you, Dr. Cohn, just for your work, and it's been outrageously inspiring and continues to be. I have a question that I remember um, having some pretty heated arguments when I was in seminary with some of my um, white colleagues about, and it was whether or not it was possible for whites to ever share their whiteness um, and to identify authentically with the black experience. And I'm wondering what that looks like beyond intellectual exposure. OK, let me just tell you what that looks like. OK. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you what that looks like. It looks like John Brown. You know John Brown? You need to read about John Brown, that white guy. That's what it looks like. It looks like civil rights workers. The two who died with the black one in Mississippi, that's what it looks like. No. They were Jews. Oh, yeah. Humanity is universal. It's just that white people come up in a culture that is inhuman. And then you have to fight to get out of that. But there were a lot of young whites 
students, young white people who went south, Mississippi, Alabama, some lost their lives. They sat around, they, they fought, yes. When, when they do that, does blackness then expand to include them? Oh, yeah. Okay. Anybody that's black that's doing the right thing. <laughs> for white folk. No, you can't make it easy, but it's possible. There's a cross for everybody. Yes, what's the problem? No, I, was just saying, I mean, no, it's not a problem. It's just you preaching. I mean, I, 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 that was the text that kind of did that for me and that caused that debate to launch because I think that some white liberals, because I, they feel very comfortable with Progressivism only involving intellectual interaction. Yeah, they 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 like the ability to not have to actualize faith in the way that you yeah, demand. Yeah, I'm not talking about them. Yeah, I know. And, and so no, that, no, no, that, no I, yeah. I'm not talking about. They taught me in seminary. Yeah, yeah. No, see, I'm I'm I I say white liberals. I say what James Baldwin said. They are our affliction. That's right. <laughs> No, I'm talking about people who, who, who ain't liberal. They ain't these white people who are Christians and stuff like that. Christians don't usually do nothing. They don't. Going to meddling. And now those young people who went south and did that, they weren't Christians. No, Christians get in the way. I mean, all these creeds. John Cavan ain't going to help you do nothing. <laughs> No, he burned Savitas at the on the stake. No, don't tell me nothing about that. All right, you're going no. to you're going to meddling now. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm against <laughs> all institutional religion. Yeah. No, institutional religion ain't gonna do nothing mm -mm. except build themselves up. No, you got to get free. Jesus was a wandering Galilean. He didn't have no institution. If he had were a part of the institution, he couldn't have done what he did. No. Don't, don't tell me about no white liberals. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you, um, thank you, Dom, Dr. Cohn, for being here, and thank you for the book. It was it really yeah. was a heartfelt read. And one of the questions that was posed to um, the pastor study yeah. on the book was, um, we want to get more insight as to. First of all, we appreciate. I appreciate you including um, the chapter on women. Yes. So thank the you. question goes. Um, was there any particular reason or rhyme to why you waited to, oh, Mary, don't you weep, to include the women? Oh, Mary, don't you weep. Oh, I, I've been writing about women since 1975, by the way. You read for, okay, you talking about in there. Well, no, I, I, I. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> you know, let me just tell you something. When you write, when you sit down to write, you don't know what you're going to write. All I know is women were on my mind. I knew I couldn't write this book without women being in it. And the reason was, is because of Dolores Williams' book, Sisters in the Wilderness. I knew I had to deal with that. Because what she said about the cross was so powerful. 
that I had. It took me 10 years to respond to her. She wrote that book in 1993, and the mine come out about 2011. So that was what I was wrestling with. But you know, everybody has to write a book the way they write it. And what I'd say to you, write your book. Write it, you know, in response to all those books you didn't like. That's what I did. <laughs> but nobody is going to answer all your questions. You have to answer your own question. And I urge everybody. It took me 10 years, but it's a, writing is hard work. It is, you know, it ain't just saying it. You got to say it with, with some degree of beauty and art. Otherwise, people are not going to read it. <laughs> so I just say to you, you, you know, I didn't know what chapter was going to come where. I thought Jesus was going to be in the first chapter. And I kept reading the New Testament. But it just didn't work out that way. I couldn't start with Jesus. That's where I wanted to start. I had to start with the spirituals and the blues. My own, myself. A book is very personal. So maybe you write your book, you put the women in a different place. <laughs> Okay, Reverend, all right. Reverend Cone, yes. I'm Allison. I'm an elder here at St. Mark. I think I autographed your book. You sure yeah, did. Yeah, uh, yeah. The one with all the little tabs on it. Uh, Reverend, I want to tell you that our founding pastor here mm -hmm. marched in Selma. Oh, did? Okay. So we are a church that has a history. Okay. This is also a property as our pastor may have told you, that was used in the Underground Railroad. Oh, okay. I want to know, uh -huh. we're here tonight because yeah. we believe we can make it, we can help, we can do something. Well, you what can. can we do? You tell me. Well, you know what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. You know what to do. Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait now. I'm saying, you know what to do. See, but the, the real reason, real thing, how much are you willing to pay? <laughs> See, that's the real question. And most of us don't want to pay very much. Jesus gave his life. He paid with his life. Martin King paid with his life. Malcolm X paid with his life. Now, we know what to do. Yeah, we, what can I do and not affect this? Keep this going. Keep the lights on. Well, I can't tell you that. So you, that's your choice. See, when I sat down to write my first book, I knew there was no turning back for me. And I knew a lot of people were going to be mad at me. But I just couldn't turn back. You have to be willing to pay the cost. And so, you, the question is not, what can I do is how much am I willing to pay? And I see those civil rights workers, those three, paid dearly. They paid with their lives. And that's, you know, if you, I, I, I wonder often, we all have to wonder, are we paying enough? Are we paying enough? So, 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 
Get together with some people. Talk it out. You know, don't go alone. Church is community. And you need somebody to hold your hand when the going gets tough. And you figure out what to do together. And it won't be so hard. But I don't want to give nobody. I think we got a lot of intelligent people here. Especially in churches and in schools and seminaries. We got a lot of intelligent people. As Baldwin says, <laughs> uh, we know we can learn all about Hegel and Hume. Shakespeare. But when it comes to this race thing, we don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. And what it is, we don't want to upset how we live in. We don't want people mad at us. Because doing right is a lonely experience. King, if you read the story of King's life, he was a very lonely man. He had a lot of people around him, but they didn't quite understand him. You can see what they're doing now that they didn't understand him. So, pray. Ask God what to do. And you might get some guidance. And I'm not just talking to the person who asked that question. I'm talking to all of them. I'm talking to myself. And that ain't an easy thing. All right. It's, we'll get one more question. I got to stop. We, we do have a question, and then okay. I think this will be the last one. And, all right. Uh, Dr. Lamar is the pastor at Metropolitan AME Church. Oh, that's right. OK. Dr. Cohn. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I, I want to thank uh, the congregation I serve for being willing to read this. This is what we do on Wednesday nights. Oh, thank you. Um, my question to you is the black church gets off the hook as if we are ontologically a church of justice. Mm -hmm. I believe, as yeah. you do, that you have these conversations more frequently in white churches than in black churches. And the reason you do, in my opinion, is because black churches today are addicted to worship and praise. Yeah. We're going to worship and yeah. praise our way straight to hell. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just want to ask you what you think, because we ask these questions, and we know in our own preaching, at our own teaching, we make the end of Christian discipleship, praise, worship, and a release of emotion. Yeah, that's right. So I want to ask you what you think of that. And then I finally want to ask you about where you are on the cross toward that last chapter when you talk about um, Dolores Williams and, and yeah. the younger woman, the theologians, and what they have to yeah. say about the cross. I believe the fact that we get the cross wrong in our churches means we get everything ethical wrong. Yeah, we and we do. get discipleship wrong. Yeah. So those are just the two things I want to put on the table. And yeah, thank you very I, much. I, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I do think black people have too much piety. You know, they do. And, it, and it's not coming out of struggle. It's coming out of privilege. And that, that, that's the worst kind of piety. And I'm glad to see you identify that. I, when I was a young AME growing up, I went into ministry when I was 16 in Arkansas. It wasn't so privileged down there. And, and the piety was more grounded in the lives of the people because they had to survive. They didn't have much. It's just those cotton fields and sharecropping. And, 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 and now the churches are so middle class. They've forgotten that they were ex-slaves founded the AME church. Ex-slaves. Richard Allen was a slave. Yeah. And we prostitute his name. When we don't bear witness to 
his faith that was carved out of a, of a very difficult time. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. And I, you know, institutions bother me. Because they focus too much on themselves. Jesus said he that was save his life or her life shall lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, you'll save it. See, I think churches spend too much time trying to save themselves with their institutions, with their ministries. And they don't have time to bear witness to the gospel. And I think that's what you're talking about. I don't know how to solve that. I wish I did. But I will say to those who are in it, what I said to the last question, we know what we have to do, but it won't be very popular. <laughs> And it might make us lose a charge and might not let us <laughs> progress on up the ladder. Uh, so I know, I know what you, what was that second question? On the cross, on this cross. Yes. Yeah. I always say is, the question that black preachers ask at the end of a sermon is, if you died tonight, where would you go? Yeah. The question that Jesus never asked. The question that makes no sense. As yeah, as that's right. So what, what is your understanding of the cross? The cross is, is what happens to people that should not happen to them. It's injustice. The cross is what other people impose on you and what you have to resist. That's the cross. That's why black people discovered the cross, not reading the Bible, but by living, living in this land. Because it was so hard. And I just want to say thank you to all of you who have come here tonight. And I am so pleased to have had a chance to see you. You give me hope just with the questions and just by being here. So keep on keeping on, and God will bless you. Thank you.